Okay, so this talk is, as the title says, uh, we're dealing with simulations in the hypersonic flow regime with SimCenter Star CCM Plus. And I'm going to cover basically two sections. The first part is going to be going through very briefly, and hopefully not too boring, some of the features that have gone into the more recent versions of SimCenter Star CCM Plus that make hypersonic simulations easier and more likely to be successful. And then part B is going to be going through just a, a sampling of applications that sort of showcase the range of things that we can handle within the hypersonic flow, flow regime. So with all that said, SimCenter Star CCM Plus, to be honest, historically, if you were sitting in a big engineering organization and somebody handed you a Mach 20 reentry flow, you wouldn't think, oh, I'm going to use SimCenter Star CCM, CCM Plus for this because it's a great hypersonics code. It, we have not been known for it. But despite that, we actually have a pretty good and, and long track record of having success in this area. And just as an example of that, uh, what I'm showing here on this slide is the bits and pieces of a report that was put out by the Navy, I believe. It was published in January 2019, but the work itself was done as far back as 2014 and 2015. And they concluded after going through a really wide variety of, of test cases that even though you, you typically think of, oh, hypersonics should be solved by these specialized, maybe more research-oriented solvers, that SimCenter Star CCM Plus did just as well, generally speaking, and even better than some of them in some of the cases. And since that report came out, we've, we've had additional things that have gone into the code that make it even better for this kind of an application. So for example, there is this thing that we call the auto CFL algorithm that monitors what your residual is doing and says, oh, I can, you know, things are converging pretty well. Maybe I can bump up the CFL and get the time step higher and converge faster. Or it, conversely, it says, oh, thing, looks like things are kind of getting into trouble. Maybe I should back off on the CFL. And it's, it's, a, it's a system that, that is designed to just make it easier. We had the expert driver that could do this before, but it had a lot more knobs. This one's a lot easier, more straightforward to use, and takes a lot less user intervention. There have been some improvements to the Awesome Plus Flux scheme that help uh, reduce carbuncle effects. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. There have been improvements to the mesh generation, uh, both prism layer mesher and the advancing layer mesher that make life a bit better for us. Uh, there's an improvement in the way that we calculate the residuals when we're when we're doing the solution, uh, and this feeds directly into our auto CFL algorithm because it's looking at the residuals to figure out whether things are going well or not. So giving it a better residual makes it more able to do its job, and it helps all applications. Anything that uses our our matrix solver is going to benefit from this. But we found particularly for hypersonic applications. It's really improved stability. Then we've added uh, adaptive mesh refinement, which makes it a whole lot easier to resolve uh, off-body flow features like shocks or wakes without knowing ahead of time where it's all going to lie. And finally, uh, not too long ago, one of our guys did a demonstration of using SimCenter Star CCM Plus to very quickly generate solutions using a coarse mesh and just solving the Euler equations, an, in, an inviscid solution. It's not something that you would typically think to use SimCenter Star CCM Plus for. Uh, there are even specialty solvers, like for example, CART 3D, if, you, if you're aware of that, uh, that are just designed to do this day in and day out. But it turns out that even though we don't think of it as our sort of application, it turns out we're really good at it. So. Um, that was a pleasant surprise, and our customer was really happy when we, when uh, he got the results. So, the carbuncle, for those of you that are, may not be familiar with this little term, it refers to something that happens because of the numerical schemes that we use. Uh, it usually shows up 
when you have like a bluff body with a sh with a bow shock standing off of it. And what you get is unphysical wrinkles in the shock. And as you can imagine, when you have a shock wave, everything depends on the angle of the incoming flow. If you add a wrinkle, then suddenly your shock wave is going to change uh, the, the pressure rise, the temperature rise, everything's going to change. And then that propagates everywhere downstream. So it, it's been a problem for decades. Everybody's working to try to find the magic bullet. We haven't completely got the magic bullet, but we do have a modification to our Awesome Plus scheme that helps. It, it allows us to better capture these curved shocks uh, when we have our generalized polyhedral mesh. Uh, and so that makes life just that much easier. Uh, so in, for example, in this particular case, which is an Apollo uh, re-entry capsule, I think it was Mach 16, but I've, it's been a while since I looked at it. It's pretty high Mach number. And uh, before, what you would have seen, instead of these nice, let's see, instead of the nice curved, you know, even contours, you would have seen more like flower shapes, uh, which is definitely not what you expect to see physically. Uh, similarly, down here on the wall shear stress, you, there were all kinds of weird patterns of unphysical recirculation and just bizarre stuff. And now we have exactly what you'd expect. You've got your, uh, uh, you've got the, the basically the point of, of where the flow hits and then everything spreads out from there. So, and so everything's behaving much more reasonably. Another thing that's happened that uh, we took advantage of the improvements to our meshing technology and also figured out um, sort of reworking our best practices that when you do have this bluff body and you have this shock standing off from it, one of the things that really helps these simulations is if you can give it a mesh that's, that's aligned with the shock as closely as possible. And so what we do now and what we recommend our users do is to grow your prism layer out to encompass that bow shock and we find that we get um, much better shock resolution, better behavior, less carbuncle. So to wrap up, I've got a few, not wrap up the whole talk, but wrap up this section of the talk, we have a few modeling tips for hypersonics. One is we have this muscle third order CD discretization with Awesome Plus, and that's what we recommend that you use by default with these uh, hypersonic simulations. There is this equilibrium air model. It's what it does is it allows you, if you have air as your medium, it allows you to capture all these other effects: ionization, dissociation, thermal, uh, you know, internal energy excitation, different states, and it allows you to do that through a simple table lookup instead of having to turn on the physical models for these individual things and run multi-species chemistry and all that kind of thing. So if you don't actually need to know the concentration of electrons in your flow, you can use uh, this kind of thing uh, to, to more quickly get a, an accurate answer. You know, there are limits, of course. Sometimes you do need to know that specific quantity and, and then it's a little harder to get out of the equilibrium, equilibrium air model. And also sometimes, your flow is not in equilibrium, so you just can't apply it. But a lot of cases you can, and it's recommended when you can. Uh, we do recommend our automatic CFL. Uh, it's a whole lot easier to use, fewer knobs, and generally does a good job. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we use the advancing layer measure to grow out the prism layer. Um, it, it came as a shock to me strangely enough, when I came to Siemens and started talking to all these guys that do automotive simulations, they're talking about, oh yeah, K epsilon this and K epsilon that. And it, in the aerospace world that I've been playing around in for a few decades now, nobody uses K epsilon turbulence modeling. Uh, and if you're in maybe in the FEMAP world, you don't even know or care what a K epsilon turbulence model is or the, the K omega SST model, which is what I'm more used to using. But uh, suffice it to say, if you're doing hypersonics, we recommend using K-omega turbulence, the K-omega SST model to start with, 
but modify the default model coefficient. Uh, this is based on work that came out of NASA Glenn by Nick Georgiatis and Dennis Yoder a few years back. And then we have these um, rule of thumb sort of heuristics for setting the turbulence modeling uh, variables. The, Another thing to think about that you don't usually think about in the context of hypersonic flows, because a lot of them are effectively laminar and you just turn off turbulence modeling altogether. But sometimes that would be a mistake. Um, so it's important when you're thinking about tackling one of these cases, whether you have to think about whether or not turbulence is going to be a factor. And in fact, sometimes tr turbulent transition is a factor. So as an example of this, I have, I'm showing here this cone flare case. It was uh, ex an experiment done in the lens facility back in the day by Mike Holden's group. And you, so it's Mach 5, uh, Reynolds number of 35 million based on the length. But what we see here in the experimental results is a very clear sign of transition. And if you go through and just assume the flow is going to be turbulent, you get this green line. And that's fine if all you care about is what's going on, back, going on here in the back. Uh, it doesn't make much difference. But if you cared about what was happening near the nose and what, you know, how the heating was going to behave, uh, you would need to turn on a transition model, which is what I've done here on the red curve. And if you've ever played around with transition modeling in CFD, you'll know that they're extremely sensitive to your free stream conditions and you know, what you feed into it has a huge effect on what's going to come out of it. In this case, I didn't tweak it at all. I just turned on our gamma RE theta model using the same uh, heuristic settings for K and omega uh, that I showed on the, on the previous slide and out comes a transition that basically falls pretty well right in line with the experiment. Uh, so that's A, extremely gratifying. It B, it might be complete luck, but it, it does seem to work. Uh, and it works, it's not just this case that it works on. Uh, we have a couple transition models to look at. The gamma model is a little bit cheaper to run for a given uh, mesh, but what we found when we did the work for the recent AAA transition modeling workshop was that the gamma model sometimes will fool you into thinking you've got grid convergence when you really don't. And you increase the mesh resolution just a little bit more and suddenly the, the transition changes completely. So the gamma RE theta model is more expensive on a given mesh, but it seems to be more benign in its behavior. So something to think about if you're if you're looking at one of these hypersonic cases. Now we're going to switch gears and go into just a, a few examples of what we can do with SimCenter Star CCM Plus in the realm of hypersonics. The first case is this Mach 10 hollow cone, another case run originally by Mike Holden, again at the Lens facility. Um, the free stream conditions are, are shown up there. Uh, this was run within SimCenter Star CCM Plus as a pure 2D axisymmetric flow. And we, in fact, instead of using our generalized polyhedral mesh, this was a structured mesh created using the directed mesher that we have in the, in the solver. We, this is an older case. Um, we're in the process of kind of going back and revisiting all these validation cases and rerunning them with our best practices, but this is the older result. Uh, but we used the coupled solver, which we would still use. We used the awesome plus flux splitting, which we would still use. And the solution acceleration, they had this uh, continuity convergence accelerator and expert driver. Those have pretty much been replaced by auto CFL. But I mean, they worked just fine. They just had a lot more knobs to play with. Uh, this case was run laminar, so didn't have to worry about transition or turbulence modeling. And uh, nitrogen was the medium here. And what we see here are the results from SimCenter Star CCM Plus. On the left are temperature contours. On the right is the heat transfer coefficient, I believe that is. And the gratifying thing is the blue curve lines up 
with the experiment really well on the right. In fact, it hits the peak even better than the uh, other computational results, Deepler being one of these specialized hypersonics codes that I mentioned, and WIND being my old code uh, that I used to work on. And it did fine, but not as well as SimCenter Star CCM Plus. Next case I want to talk about real quick is this shock shock interaction case, yet another Mike Holden experiment. In this case, it's Mach 16, and they had a cylinder sitting in the tunnel. And then they had, so there's a bow shock in front of the cylinder, and then they had an oblique shock that they generated that impacted that bow shock right in front of the cylinder. And the the challenge here is to look at what happens when you include or don't include the two temperature thermal non-equilibrium effects, because you know, the one shock hitting the other shock, you can get some pretty excited molecules in there. In this case, it, this was a, done using 2D, not axisymmetric. Again, the coupled solver, again, awesome plus flux splitting. The same solution acceleration as before, except now we would use auto CFL if, when we rerun it in, here in the near future, we hope. This was run, however, with a multi-component gas, a five species air model. And we used, like I said, the thermal non-equilibrium solver. There was uh, some adaptive meshing using for this particular case for the polyhedral mesh uh, that we ran. Uh, this was the earlier, more manual version of uh, adaptive meshing. We now have the, the full out automatic algorithm that can be applied as well. Uh, so what we see here on the left is the result on the structured mesh. And as I mentioned earlier, when you have a structured mesh, you can align the mesh pretty well with the shock. And when you do that, you get extremely crisp shocks. On the right is the polyhedral measure. It's not quite as crisp, but you'll note that despite the polyhedral cells kind of being lumpy and not, not being perfectly lined up, it still does a very good job in capturing the overall physics uh, that we're looking for. This uh, heat flux is a comparison of what you get uh, with, when you have thermal non-equilibrium versus the, the default thermal equilibrium. And what you see is on the left, when you just when you when you assume thermal equilibrium, you can capture the peak heat flux, but you tend to to get the peak in the wrong location. And the, the benefit of turning on th thermal non-equilibrium for a case like this is it gets the heat transfer much closer to the experimental uh, result. So those were some relatively, you know, very simple geometries, 2D type runs. Let's talk about a more full featured case. So this is specifically focused on adaptive mesh refinement for the shock and wake structures on this HL20 vehicle. This is from a paper that was presented a, a while back by one of our guys, Jeremy Hankey. Uh, the geometry was from a scan from this wind tunnel test article from a while back, although you may recognize that this is very similar to the Sierra Nevada Dream, Dream Chaser, which is a gather being built as we speak and getting ready for certification. Um, the free stream conditions were Mach 10 and fully turbulent for all the runs. Uh, but one of the things that, that was of interest here was using adaptive mesh refinement to create, to automatically handle uh, the, the changing shock and wake structures as you vary the angle of attack. This is a, a newer run. We used a somewhat newer version of SimCenter Star CCM Plus. So we used the coupled solver again. We used the muscle third order central difference scheme, which is recommended. We use the awesome plus, like I've been saying. This is a case where the equilibrium air model was used and the K omega, the SST model was used for turbulence. Uh, convergence was assessed as, as being done or the, the simulation was basically considered complete when you had variation in the lift and drag coefficients of less than 0.001 over the last 500 iterations. 
So the first step in getting this thing going was to create a baseline mesh from which all of the AMR simulations would be run. Uh, this was a relatively simple mesh, 3 million cells, 10 to 15 prism layers with the target normal spacing giving a Y plus of about one. So you can see you do have the boundary layer mesh near the body, but away from it, there's no, no refinement specified whatsoever. As a comparison point, Jeremy also put together a static mesh, sort of like what you would traditionally do before we had any sort of mesh adaptation. And uh, this was a 9 million cell mesh, the same basic surface settings and near wall prism layer settings, but he added volumetric and wake refinement. So here you see up front, there's clearly a region that's designed to catch that bow shock. There's regions to catch the, the wake back here and then near the body if, in case there's waves flying around, he added some uh, refinement. So putting the two of them side by side, you can see there's, there's a pretty significant difference uh, to, in the starting point. What you end up with though is even more different. Uh, you still have you know, very coarse mesh upstream of the shocks in the, in the AMR case, but here at, for the angle of attack uh, 10 degree case, you can see that the mesh has refined around the shock structures really well, and it's also refined around the wake. And of course the static mesh hasn't changed. Looking a little bit more closely, uh, Jeremy set this whole process up so that he limited the maximum number of times that a cell can be split to three. And he said, if the cells below a certain size, don't split it at all. So what we see is that in this, um, in the bow shock area, away from the, the blunt nose, the, the grid is refined to the maximum maximum level that it can, uh, that's being permitted to. Near the nose, you actually hit the minimum cell limit. So not it didn't necessarily always refine to the third level uh, that it otherwise would. The other thing to note that's kind of interesting is that the wake refinement, it's refined the mesh all the way out as far as it goes, and also with this lower side shock. Um, it's a little bit interesting to me though that the, the upper side uh, bow shock, you know, the one that's the oblique shock that's going off the, the upper surface, that refinement only goes out part way. Now it's possible we're only looking at surface lift and drag. So the, the lift and drag may be fully converged, but this shock might still have been developing and we might see more refinement if he'd continued to run it. So here's a look at the Mach number contours, uh, the static mesh and the AMR mesh. And you can see that they have the same basic stuff, but you can also see that there's a lot sharper refinement of the wake and the, and the off body shock. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, the static mesh actually does maybe a little bit better of capturing this um, off body shock in the, uh, on the upside of of the geometry. Looking a little bit closer at the uh, at the nose, you can see that there is much, much better resolution of that shock. That's about as crisp as you're likely to see. Uh, the static mesh, of course, is limited because the mesh is static. Um, but even so, it does a pretty good job. And uh, yeah, and, and as he points out, we do even away from this nose, you get a much better um, better refinement on that lower side shock. And that translates to the uh, shock standoff distance is pretty significantly different in the two solutions. Now, one thing I have to admit here is that um, when Jeremy got this case, it was something that had been used for demonstrations for a while. And so he grabbed it and reran it and worked with it for this particular paper. And then after everything was done, he went to look at like surface temperatures and discovered that whoever set it up originally didn't bother to put the correct experimental conditions in. So we have 
qualitative results here where we see, okay, we have a shock standoff distance of 3.6 millimeters and 5.4 millimeters. And, and we see that the wall distance distribution is much smoother for the AMR than the static mesh. And this, of course, translates straight into surface temperature. Um, and we see that there's big differences in the, in the way things look. Uh, a lot lower temperature on the on the AMR mesh than the static mesh, but we don't know which is right. I mean, I know which one I would bet on, but I can't unfortunately say, yep, we got it on on, on the left there. So the next thing that we wanted to talk about is when you run with AMR, you start with that same baseline mesh and then it develops the, the off-body shock capturing and weight capturing for whatever angle of attack you give it. Uh, and so here you see examples from this uh, angle of attack sweep that range from minus 10 degrees to 30 degrees. So the, the wake, the shocks are very different, but the AMR algorithm just robustly does what it needs to do. And you end up with some beautiful pictures without, again, having to do much in the way of manual intervention, you just change one parameter and rerun. Now, even though the pressure and temperature were not done correctly, you can still do pretty good comparison with, with experiment for the lift and drag, because they are not, the lift and drag coefficients don't, don't depend so much on the specific experimental uh, conditions, although there's probably some mismatch due to that little oversight on whoever's part it was. But what you can see here is that we match the trends with experiment very closely. And uh, we, you also see that the AMR, well, maybe you can see, if you look really closely, the AMR mesh predictions are slightly closer to experimental data. Um, now you might say, well, okay, all that work to turn on AMR, what's the point? And the point is here that lift and drag, if that's all you care about, maybe it doesn't matter so much. Lift and drag, of course, is determined by only the forces right there on the surface. The off-body shocks don't matter so much. But if you had other geometry downstream that was being impacted by these off-body shocks, it would make a pretty huge difference. Uh, so it just depends on the, on the case that you're looking at and, and what your particular needs are as to whether you need to resolve the wake and, and those structures uh, super accurately. So to conclude, the AMR model was shown to be effective to automatically resolve these off-body flow features. And the predictions that, that Jeremy got matched well with the static best practices and the experimental data. And they were able to do all of this without having an explosion in the mesh count. Uh, if I recall correctly, the the final meshes for the AMR runs were on the order of like 10 or 12 million uh, volume cells. So about like the static mesh, but obviously more tuned to a specific case. So that's what I've got for today. Uh, looks like maybe we've got a few minutes for questions if there are any. And if we don't get to answer your questions today, here's my contact information. You can shoot me email or what have you, and I'll try to answer whatever questions you have.